All right, so thank you again for tuning into our final presentation today. We'd like to welcome you to When and How Will Gold, Silver, and Mining Stocks Respond to Inflation? It is my pleasure to introduce our panel host for today, Mr. Adrian Day, Chairman and CEO of Adrian Day Asset Management, who specializes in global diversification and resource equities. Adrian, I pass the baton to you, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm the moderator of this panel. I was um, uh, press ganged into it by our two excellent panelists who are both good friends. Um, first up, um, I was going to say on the top, I don't know how it shows for you, is Rich Chekin. He's the president and COO of Asset Strategies International, which is uh, primarily a, a, a coin dealer, bullion dealer. Um, and, and I know many of you have, have uh, dealt with him. And uh, someone I've known for probably 40 years, I'm guessing. Um, and then the other panelists will be Brian London. Brian is the editor of the Gold Newsletter. He's also the ringmaster of the New Orleans Investment Conference. And again, someone I have known for probably 40 years. Both of them, um, not only well-informed on the market with a good deal of experience, but also uh, very good friends. And, and I have to say, if I may, you both gave excellent talks this morning. Uh, and we'll be looking at uh, some of the points that you raised. So the first question for both of you, well, the first question actually is just for Brian. Where's your tie? <laughs> okay. You're lucky that I am this formal. I only put on the sport coat because I knew the both of you would be in formal attire. Uh, so the first, uh, the second question then is for both of you and it's the topic of, the, of, it's the topic of this particular panel. You know, we've had money printing, no one can deny. We've got inflation, transitory or otherwise. We've got negative real interest rates and we've got global chaos. And why is gold not responding? Who wants to go first? I'll take a swing at that. You know, the price of gold has, first off, has no relation to the supply and demand dynamics for actual gold. They only reflect the supply and demand dynamics for paper gold and paper metals. They're basically set by speculators um, who have no concern about whether people really want gold, how much gold there is out there in actual physical farm form. They're only concerned about what is the next Fed official going to say or what the tea leaves may say about future Fed policy, because all of the markets are addicted to this monetary adrenaline. As I say, they're not addicted to easy money, they're addicted to ever easier money. So they're trading based on those headlines. And that's where the price of gold is set. Right now, understandably, if you take that mindset, everybody is worried or wondering about how the Fed will react to inflation, whether that will be sticky, sticky persistent, or like the Fed is hoping, transitory. Um, and then what is the Fed going to do about it? What can the Fed do about it? So we're watching a really dramatic play uh, acted out in front of us right now as the Fed in real time has to react to this flow of data and what it's going to do. And it really determines the paths of every asset class out there. So it's why isn't the gold responding? It's responding because, you know, it depends on what the Fed's going to do. And, and it's not where real rates are now. It's not uh, where any uh, of those statistics you mentioned may be, but where they're headed uh, and how that relates to what the Fed is going to do. So basically people believe what the Fed is saying? Is that what you're... <laughs> yeah, if you look at real interest rates, if you look at uh, real, you know, the 10 year, say the 10 year uh, treasury rate yield uh, 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 deflated as it were by five year inflation expectations, which are then derived from tips yields. So this is where the speculators, the traders are projecting interest rates to be. You'll have negative real rates of about 0.9%. Now, if you use treasury yields and uh, deflate those by the CPI, then you have negative real rates of between four and 5%, which 
parallels what we had in the 1970s when we had the, the really you know, rocketing metals prices. So that's the real dichotomy to me. And that really tells you who's driving the markets. It's not where inflation is, but where it's going, where the market believes it's going. We didn't have all of this fancy schmancy, you know, uh, um, inflation expectations back in the 1970s. It was what it was, despite whatever Arthur Burns was trying to do to the numbers. But inflation was the CPI. Um, and people took those readings and traded on them. And then we had reactions in the metals because of it. Now it's, uh, we have this data that is basically manipulated data because the elephant in the room in the, in the bond market is the Fed itself. So every statistic they're looking at is tainted by the Fed's own buying action, major buying action in that market. So it's not only arguably a, uh, you know, a, a, the wrong measure to look, it's also a tainted wrong inappropriate measure to look at. So yeah, I was going to say, what, is, what, is, what do the 10 year yields even tell us when the Fed owns 60 percent of them? I mean, right. what, what does it tell us at all? Uh, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions, uh, confusion out there. I think the Fed has created a lot of it. I've been very critical of the Fed and I don't see that stopping anytime soon. I think their role really should be transparency and trying to tell people what's going on and doing their best to fix it. Um, but they're out of ammunition. And I think what they're trying to do is confuse us into not doing anything and not panicking and not losing confidence in the dollar right now. Uh, when, you know, when Jerome Powell comes out and somebody asks him about his infamous, well, it's not time to start talking about talking about tapering. And they threw that in his face at the last FOMC Q&A and he giggled or chuckled and he said, yeah, I think we're gonna have to retire that. I think it's served its purpose. And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell's the purpose? Just to confuse us? Uh, Cause that's what they're doing. Um, they have no ammunition. The interest rates are, are near zero. They can't do anything there. When they talk about raising it, when they talk about uh, cutting back on, on the uh, uh, asset purchases, immediately the markets react. Nobody wants the punch bowl to go away. Everybody wants the party to go on. We have an everything bubble. When you can buy art that is air for millions of dollars and just believe that it's something when it's absolutely nothing and pay money for it, we're in a bubble. There's no question about it. I think people are worried about missing out on the gains that continue in that everything bubble. That fear of missing out, I think, is what's keeping people out of gold. And I will tell you, I, I commented on the back end with both of you yesterday, day before, I'm starting to see that change a little bit. I mean, we're seeing some well-heeled investors coming in and making purchases uh, and very substantial ones. And the words out of every one of their mouths is, I'm worried about what's going on out there right now. And I'm the one, I'm the gold dealer, right? I'm, I'm supposed to be the crazy, you know, skies falling fear mongerer. Um, I'm the one saying, listen, it's not that bad. Uh, and they're coming in and saying, no, no, it's really that bad. I want to buy gold now. I think we're starting to see a little bit of a change of sentiment right now. Well, that's really interesting because the other uh, title of this topic is when, uh, you know, when, not why has gold not responded, and then when will it respond? And, you know, sometimes markets respond to events, and sometimes there's no particular event that provokes a change. It's just a slow or gradual change in sentiment. You run out of sellers. Uh, buyers think they're better, you know, would-be buyers think they'd better move uh, uh, now. When do you think gold will respond, both of you? I, uh, I thought and have been saying that it, it, it won't respond for, the no for another few weeks, two to four weeks, and that's using some technical momentum indicators that I like. I'm not really much of a market technician, but I've found a few things over the years that I like. And one is the 14 week stochastic, which swings, it's a momentum indicator and it has broad swings and gold typically doesn't turn around and exhibit uh, upward momentum until it's exhausted its downward momentum. And that's usually below say a 20 level on that stochastic. And looking at it right now, we haven't approached that bottoming area. Uh, that it typically looks at, that it typically uses, and it looks like that would be two to four weeks before that happens. 
looking at the calendar, I'm looking at perhaps the next Fed meeting and uh, September 22nd, I believe it ends, as maybe a turning point or a week or so before that as the market kind of anticipates whatever you know trial balloons the Fed puts out there. Because what's happened in recent history since all of these markets have been driven by monetary policy to such a great extent is that um, the, the speculators out there that are driving the markets typically move once the anticipated event happens. Having bought the rumor, they then sell the news. So gold bottomed in December of 2015, and actually we predicted it in gold newsletter that it was gonna bottom when the Fed made its first rate hike, actually had its first rate hike, which it did. That marked the absolute bottom and gold rallied for six months, after, more than six months afterwards, uh, very strongly. That I think something like that is going to happen again, uh, tempered by the fact that everything's moving more quickly right now. And there's some skepticism that the Fed can actually raise rates at all. So maybe I'm just being hopeful and, and you know talking my book, but I think some kind of a timeline on tapering will, if not create a bottom in gold and start a rally, will at least uh, put some action in the gold market once that timeline, the calendar for tapering actually gets out there. Rick? Yeah, I, and I'll, I'll uh, throw in, there's some questions coming in as well. I'll, I'll that, that pertain, I'll throw them out as well. But uh, the bottom line is, I, I hear people telling me right now that gold, I, I heard one gold dealer today on the Money Show panel say that gold was expensive uh, at $1,800 an ounce. And I'm thinking to myself, he's not talking to any of my clients because they're all wondering why it's so dirt cheap right now. Um, and I do believe it's dirt cheap, um, but I, I just, I don't worry about it. I, I have immense patience. I mean, this is a proven asset over millennia. It's not changing in my lifetime. I'm sorry. Uh, gold continues to do its job, whether it be at $1,800 or $2,200. It is that insurance in my portfolio. It has performed that function as long as I've known gold and had it in that role. And it's not changing right now. I don't need it to, to catapult to $2,000 or $3,000. I just need it to continue to do what it, do, it does. It's a very stable market. Sam, Sam is asking, you know, could it be that, uh, you know, they're, they're hanging on to Powell, they're looking to reappoint him and they can pin inflation on him and the previous administration. Uh, and if so, does that present some sort of curve to the bond market? That was the related question there from Sam. I don't know if anybody wants to touch on that, but uh, I think there's a lot of politics going on right now. Again, uh, I thought the Fed was supposed to be independent of politics. In my presentation, I gave that quote from Greenspan at, at New Orleans Investment Conference a few years ago, where he said, you know, that uh, they are not independent. Uh, they are controlled politically. Uh, and I think what we're seeing right now is a result of that. Yeah. Well, part, I mean, you know, part of a problem is, um, and I had a bit of a, a set to with Greenspan at New Orleans um, privately. I mean, Part, part of the thing is that all these, all these Fed chairmen, let's face it, for whatever reason, they like the position. Greenspan really liked the glamour that came with it. Um, you know, Bernanke, I think, liked the fact that he could put into practice some of his theories from, from academia. Uh, Yellen saw it as a stepping stone. I mean, they all like to be in charge. And so, it's going to be a very rare man or woman that is going to say, particularly these days, is going to say to the administration and Congress, we are not accommodating your spending. You know, you have to do something about your spending. That's not our job. But as you both know, and everybody knows, the Fed is simply accommodating whatever spending is being thrown at it uh, with no pretense of controlling the budget or balance in the budget. I don't so, think President Biden could have asked for a better yes man. <laughs> well, exactly. And that's why I suspect one of the reasons, as well as the one that Sam gave there, I, I think he probably will be uh, reappointed. I mean, why not? <laughs> You've got everything you want from him. Um, Brian, let me just ask you, you mentioned there uh, uh, that, that gold often bottoms when the Fed first starts to tighten. Why is that? It sounds counterintuitive. Well, it, it does, but that whole buy the rumor, sell the news phenomenon in the markets is, is counterintuitive. 
the uh, the markets are driven by speculation, so they're betting on the Fed tightening. So once that trade is over with, they exit the trade. Now, for speculators who are who are trading along those lines, if they feel like the Fed is going to uh, start tightening and make some action, monetary action, well, what are they doing? They're shorting gold. So there, there's selling pressure on gold. And you can see that in the price charts leading up to that, that gold goes through, well, you know, at the long bear market from summer of 2011 through to that December of 2015. But in the months just ahead, it, it, it kept declining and then traded sideways until that Fed move and then took off. So to me, what happens and what happened in that instance was that the speculators were shorting gold as the event happened, then they move on to another trade um, and they, they covered their shorts, which is in effect buying, but it releases that selling pressure on, on uh, the news. Uh, and gold actually rose. And, and I, the history shows that the gold actually rises quite often during a period of rising interest rates. It's the direction of real rates that's the real key there. Mm -hmm. And for at least short periods, even uh, with the dollar rising against other fiat currencies. Sure. And sometimes, of course, you get the phenomenon that the Fed starts to raise rates. We saw this, uh, uh, what, 2004-05, the Fed starts to raise rates. But it's very, very clear that they are behind the curve. They're behind the inflation curve. And that only becomes truly clear once they actually start to raise rates. You can see that they're behind the curve. And in that example, they were raising rates a quarter of a point per year right. <laughs> initially. So if that isn't hesitant and you know, and showing inability, then I don't know what else does. Sure. I'm still, I'm still amazed at how that has any impact on anything. A uh, quarter point, honestly. Um, just so you know, uh, Cami was asking for clarification. We talk about people are starting to buy. Uh, are they talking about buying physical gold or buying? mining stocks, I could tell you what I was referring to was physical gold buying uh, for the most part, uh, but maybe you guys want to comment on what you're seeing in the mining sector here. Ryan? Uh, yeah, I think that, it, and I, I'm sure both of you will agree, if you're talking about gold, it's really bifurcated uh, asset. There's, there's two ways to to buy gold, two reasons to buy gold. One is as insurance for your the rest of your portfolio, insurance against all of your wealth, everything you own that's denominated in your home currency. You buy gold to insure against that inevitability of that currency's depreciation. So that's one reason people buy gold. And frankly, that's just physical gold. There are some paper representations that can be used for longer term holdings but everybody needs physical bullion to insure against that. Um, the other thing is uh, as an investment, if you look at these uh, macro trends that are supporting higher relative gold prices, higher prices for gold relative to the underlying currencies. And what that says, it, are there macro trends that are depreciating or promise to more rapidly depreciate the, your currencies or fiat currencies? If so, then you see that trend you see that gold price is going to rise. So you invest to leverage that trend. A lot of ways to do that. You can do futures options, uh, some leveraged ETFs, mutual funds in mining equities or the mining equities themselves. But most people that we talk to at these investment conferences are doing it through mining stocks. Um, and they represent to me right now, really good value um, time is money, so when are we going to see that next move in the metals? Uh, it, it's harder to predict. I think over the next three to four weeks, we'll see uh, a new rally beginning. Um, so right now, I guess it, I'd have to say that the producers are good value, and some of the juniors that I like are uh, good value primarily because of their individual stories, whether they're actually finding something or not. Yeah, I mean, of course, when you talk about the mining stocks, timing, I'm not a timer, I don't think you are, Brian, but timing becomes, or let's say when you buy, becomes so much more critical. And you can look at gold bullion, for example, and if you bought it at the worst possible time you could have bought it this year, you know, you're only down a handful of dollars. And if you're buying it for insurance, it's meaningless. 
Yeah. If you bought the gold stocks at the worst possible time, you could have bought them. You know, you're down, I don't know, you, I don't have it up on my screen. You're probably down 20%, I would think. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's just from buying, yeah, you're down 20%. And that's just from buying this year. That's only buying three months ago. So the, the, the timing or when you buy becomes much more, much more important uh, to that. Let me, let me just ask one more question, if, I'm, if I may, relating to why hasn't gold moved? And I'll ask Rich this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, competition, competition from the stock market, you kind of alluded to, competition from crypto, which uh, Richard Duff asks us about. How, how, how do you respond to that? Is, is crypto real competition for gold? Uh, I think everything is competition right now. Uh, is it meaningful? I don't think so. Um, you're seeing money moving into Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever the case might be. You're seeing money moving into the stock market. You're seeing money move into some of these fictitious new, uh, I don't even know what to call them. Uh, I forget the some whatever rights or whatever uh, that people could buy into for the future. NFTs or tokens. What's that tokens? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So basically money is looking for a home where it's going to get some sort of a return. And let's face it, gold is not a get rich quick scheme. It is not a, uh, a return on investment type purchase. It's a store of purchasing power type purchase. So I think it loses a little bit in that regard. I get back to what I said earlier. When, when people start to feel like that bubble is going to burst, whether it be you know, uh, another drastic drop in crypto prices or another uh, pullback in the market or some other crazy thing going on out there. When people start to get worried that that return isn't coming, they are going to start to bank their profits and they're going to turn to gold. It's going to be one of the safe havens of choice. So I think there's a little off take from the gold market, but I really don't see the market suffering, to be honest with you. We've had steady buying for a year and a half, two years at this point. Um, some of it was a reaction to the pandemic and the shutdowns. Uh, we had some selling. We actually had people that sold some of their cat catastrophe insurance to be able to pay their employees so they didn't have to let them go. Uh, we saw some of that over the past year and a half, uh, but I think gold is doing its job. It's holding well, and it will take off. As I mentioned this morning, look at the money supply. That is a uh, gold has tracked the money supply for a very, very long time. Uh, we've just had a hyperbolic increase in the money supply. I expect to see gold prices respond in the same direction. When you say money supply, you're talking about the global money supply. Absolutely. And, and all over the world, they're printing money. That's how they're dealing yeah. with things. So um, gold should fare well. If you look at its performance against any fiat currency, uh, hands down, it's the winner. There's no question. And at $1,800, it's still the winner. So I'm not upset. People were, were upset at twelve dollars to $1,300 when it couldn't get out of that range. And we all know that on the downside, that's where it held when it dropped from eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars an ounce, right? So that was going to be significant resistance to move back up into a, a bull market. When it when it sat there, people complained about how gold's not doing anything. It leapfrogged up, made new all time highs, came back and settled five, six hundred dollars higher, and I got people frustrated again with gold. Just be patient; it's coming. You know, my experience is gold. I, I want to say gold bugs. I mean, I'm I'm a gold bug. I don't mind saying it, but um, gold 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 investors are always dissatisfied with the price of gold. They always expect it or think it should be higher than it actually is. That's my experience, mm -hmm. and I think part of that comes from a misunderstanding, as you've been talking about, Rich, of what what gold's function in a portfolio is. Um, but people always expect too much from gold. I think. So let's just let's just look at something else, and that's um, you know the Fed's been talking about tapering, as as you said, Rich. It went from maybe, perhaps, could be maybe in the future sometime, to uh, some of the Fed spokesmen being a little more specific. Um, oh no, Adrian, they've been very specific. We know exactly what we're heading toward: substantial further progress. I mean, that's clearly yeah. defined metric, right? <laughs> but. Um, what do you see, looking a bit further out, what do you see as a possibility or the likelihood that the Fed actually in any meaningful way 
um, cutting back on uh, asset purchases and raising interest rates, both of you. Do you, do you think that that's possible? I, it's gonna have to happen at some point, but when it does, it's not gonna be pretty. And they know that just hinting at it right now is causing severe strain and, and, and concern. I mean, you talked two meetings ago, they talked about two years from now, potentially raising interest rates and the stock market tanked, right? This past meeting, they talked about, well, we may start talk, we're talking about tapering, we may do something by the end of the year, the stock market immediately jerked backwards. Um, the, the participants in this environment are not gonna like it. Um, and the reaction will be a sell-off. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Fed really can't, well, they can't get too far down the road of toward normalization or raising rates. Uh, the question is still in play whether they can at all. And, and that's really for two reasons. The first being what Rich just talked about, the financial house of cards they built is fragile and is dependent again on ever easier money. So tightening obviously runs contrary to that and threatens to topple that entire house of cards. The other thing is the, uh, the debt service costs. Uh, if you just look at the federal debt right now, and I ran numbers three years ago that already showed that it was in nigh near impossible to raise rates, even the Fed's fund, Fed funds rate to 3% without generating debt service costs of a trillion dollars a year, which I thought was politically impossible. Since then, we've added about $7 trillion to the federal debt. And the numbers and that bar of interest rates where things just get out of hand is dramatically lowered. So the Fed really cannot, under this monetary regime, have anything approaching normal interest rate policy. And in fact, rates on a real basis, inflation adjusted, have to be negative. Otherwise, the, the, the federal budget just craters under the weight of those debt service costs. So they have to they have to depreciate the currency more quickly at a higher rate than the rate that they're paying on uh, servicing the debt. Otherwise, everything just tumbles. Um, so no, they can't uh, really get far down that road. And when the market realizes that, I think that's when things get really interesting in the gold and silver markets. If you look at the various things that the Fed is concerned with, whether they should be concerned with it or not, um, one is employment, one is economic growth, one is the stability of the dollar, I say stability in quotes. Oh yeah, it's very stable. Dollar, and, and one are financial assets, and then lastly, the dollar. So of those five things, which do you think the Fed really doesn't care about or will, will let go first if it has to let, because they can't keep them all up forever. Which one will it let go first? Well, yeah, so I they're think gonna they're, they're going to taper, right? Yeah, they're, they're going to start tapering. I think with the, that kind of relates to one of the questions that we got uh, from Sam. You say they're piling up. We should address some of those. Yeah, yeah. Sam uh, Vakil, I guess, says, you know, talks about stagflation and is that good for the dollar uh, debasement, good for precious metals? What well, obviously was in the 1970s, but it gets to what you're saying. What can they do? What are they going to be focused on? Our friend Peter Bookvar has been talking about this in some of his recent missives about how we're already in stagflation. Now, the question is whether the, the Fed is going to address the stag or deflation. And, you know, in the 1970s, they addressed deflation and we had Volcker and that put an end to it. And that returned us to some period of normalcy in regards to, to inflation and monetary policy. Well, we don't have a Volcker around today. There is none on the horizon, and what they're going to be concerned with, which they tell us, is the stag part, not the inflation part. So they're going to keep stoking the fire to, you know, inflation be damned, and that, of course, is going to be even more, I think, bullish for precious metals than what we saw uh, in the 1970s. Frankly, everything is so, um, you know, it's so out of control at this point that if I was a Fed official, I would not be worried about any of those factors. I would be worried about buying gold, silver, copper jacketed lead and finding some place to hide out uh, because there's going to be yeah. you know, 
Torch well, I, don't, I agree. I don't think we have a Volker uh, even to choose from right now to step into that role. We don't have somebody of that kind of prescience. Uh, and let's face it, what he did was he jacked up interest rates and look at the yeah. debt ser servicing uh, at those levels. It just it just can't happen. It will lead to some sort of a downgrade for, for the U.S. Uh, everybody's calling for a reset. It sure looks like we're due for a reset or an incredibly painful period. Uh, where they they just finally start to normalize things and the markets collapse and you know I don't know we I don't know if we'll see soup lines we have soup lines today there it's just handed out in in cards that you go to the supermarket with but we've we've got soup lines let's make no mistake about it just like the depression um, the. I don't think they can raise interest rates. I think they cut, uh, uh, start doing tapering. I, I think either way, the market's going to react badly. And I just personally would suggest let's take our medicine and be done with it. I think when you prolong this and you you replace one bubble with another bubble, uh, it just it ends very very badly, and you're just magnifying the consequences. I was not a fan of bailing out the banks that were too big to fail. Bad businesses shouldn't be rewarded. If they if they were bad businesses, they should fail. They should go away. The people that invested them made a bad decision. They should lose money. I'm sorry. Um, but if if we didn't take on their problems and adopt them and spread them across everyone, uh, I think we would have been through that crisis a lot quicker. We've just magnified it. Well, if this goes back to Greenspan, of course. He yep. was the one who really started it, bailing out long-term capital, you know, a hedge fund, for goodness sake. I mean, there was absolutely no basis for doing that, in my view. And interestingly, um, I guess very interesting in, in uh, Greenspan's psychology and psychosis, that was the, perhaps the greatest and most unappreciated risk that he, in a conversation with me, he told me that the, the fact that we were now backing the derivative exposure of all the too big to fail institutions was perhaps the biggest unappreciated risk out there, not even you know exceeding even the federal debt because nobody knew the level of those obligations, even the institutions themselves. So yeah, and, and you make a good point. He started that. Um, and now he said that was the biggest risk and the biggest moral and financial hazard facing the US. Absolutely. So we've got a couple of questions here, a very specific one on, uh, which I think is, is a good one. Don asks about the debt ceiling. Would an increase in the debt ceiling cause a downgrade in the US and the US dollar? And would that result in a gold rally? And then we might also talk about the next question from Michael concerning, you know, currencies, unstable currencies, uh, and um, uh, how will a scenario of unstable currencies, high inflation and then high deflation, how will that affect precious metals? I, I can start off with that. I don't have a ton to offer. I will say that um, adding on to my comments previously, you know where I stand. Let's take our damn medicine already. Um, and let's let's get a, a free market that can give us accurate price discovery for all these assets, as opposed to just propping it up and using smoke and mirrors and not knowing what the hell we're holding in our hands in terms of value. Um, I just assume let the house of cards fall and then start building up a new house of cards um, with hopefully a, a firmer foundation. Um, I don't think anybody really knows. We are in uncharted waters. The, the Chairman Powell said it himself. He said, we have no... Uh, experience navigating these waters, i.e. post-pandemic, post-shutdown. We have no models to be able to guide us through such waters. Um, yet, and even though he was completely fooled by inflation, yet he believes that, um, that they're confident that they can guide us through. I don't know where the confidence is coming from, um, but I also know that free markets will solve this if we let them. And I think government just needs to get the hell out of the way and let them solve it. Yeah, I would say that the debt ceiling and the increase in the debt ceiling will have no effect. That's just a, a game of political brinksmanship that comes around every now and then. They will actually increase the debt ceiling because the, the fear is that if they don't, then that would cause a downgrade in U.S. debt. Um, and the, the risk, as Michael mentions, of a unstable currency, uh, one year with high inflation, the next year with a high deflation, I don't think that kind of instability is a risk because every currency in the world uh, is actually racing to the bottom of the hill trying to devalue against all of the others. So 
all that will happen relative to each currency is that uh, sometimes one will be in the lead in that race down the hill and another will lag and then they'll change places somewhere in that race but they will all be depreciating losing value against real things primarily gold and silver from a monetary aspect or monetary metal aspect but other tangible things even you know real estate fine art uh real things with that yeah tangible no questions aspects. about it Let, let's talk about inflation mr chu asked about inflation he asked specifically are we following in japan's footsteps because of course japan for almost 40 years now has been on qe um buying up assets uh the government is the majority owner of Japanese uh, bond ETFs and equity ETFs, and yet Japan does not have either a strong economy or inflation. So are we following in their, in their footsteps and this, could this be the path that the US is on? I, I think there's no question. Uh, what, what was that song from the 80s? I think I'm turning Japanese. I think that's exactly what our economy is doing. Uh, to some degree, I would think the um, Japan is kind of in that gray area, it has very little growth. It has lost all of its dynamism, post-World War II dynamism. And so that's the price they're paying for, for this kind of government control over its financial markets and manipulated financial markets. That I, I think might be possible in the US, but I think culturally the US has kind of an inherent dynamism that will fight against that kind of an outcome. Uh, but then again, the markets are still dependent on, on much easier money. Um, so I, th I think what we're going to see is, is you know, just that kind of rapid depreciation in, in currencies. Uh, and the, the difference between Japan, the primary difference between Japan and the US is the US has the world's reserve currency. So if you're depreciating the world's reserve currency, then everything appreciates against it. Um, including, you know, other currencies, but primarily the, again, tangible assets. Right, right. We've only got a few minutes left. Let's, let's end on, um, uh, someone asked a question about, um, you know, uh, what, what should people be buying? Yeah. Um, and we touched on that a little bit earlier, but, you know, who should be buying physical gold? Who should be buying ETFs? Who should be buying mining stocks? how much and so on and so forth. Who wants to go there first? Uh, I, I'll, I'll say my piece and then hand off. Um, I think in terms of physical gold, I think everybody should own it. Uh, plain and simple, it is your wealth insurance as you know, dearly departed founder Glenn Kershaw always used to say, you know, it is like homeowner's insurance for your home. It's automobile insurance for your car. Uh, it's health insurance for you is wealth insurance for your portfolio. If you have a portfolio, I don't care if there's a nickel in it or a million dollars, you should protect it with gold. Uh, so my personal belief, and I know that's self-serving as a gold dealer, uh, but I just, I, I've seen it work for nations, for corporations, and for individuals in times of crisis. It has done its job, and I've seen that with my own eyes. So I think everybody ought to have it, period. Uh, beyond that, I only like precious metals and particularly like silver, maybe platinum right now enters into the conversation for profit purposes, uh, a very tiny allocation of physicals. More people look to the mining stocks and this is where I'll hand off, you know, it's different. You're not owning physical gold. You own a company that mines gold, you don't own any gold. That's part of your equities allocation, although it's related in the sector, but you can get outsized returns. Uh, but you bring in a few more variables and I'll kind of hand off to you guys, but gold for everyone always, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that question was relating or they were asking a bit of, you know, do you have to have a million dollars in assets to invest in physical metals, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And getting back to what Rich was saying and what Glenn had originally said about home insurance, the difference there is you don't, you buy home insurance, but you don't expect your house to catch on fire. Uh, you buy gold because you do expect the dollar to be depreciated, to lose its purchasing power at some rate. It, it's going to do that, whether that rate is greater or lesser is the question, but you expect that to happen. So you're not uh, insuring against a possibility, you're insuring against an inevitability. Um, so so that on that, you should, you can always own some metals. 
and you may consider things like silver and and you should have some of those uh, metals in your your access ready access um, regardless of your portfolio size on the other hand if you want to leverage these trends by investing in mining stocks you if you want to take advantage of the inefficiency of the market do your research buy some of the best newsletters go to the conferences really dig down and you can maximize your returns. If you don't have the time, money, or um, or willingness to, to put that effort in, buy the ETFs, uh, GDX, GDXJ, uh, some allocation to those would be uh, getting your foot into the mining share market. And of course, all of this is not to pretend like I'm giving you individualized investment advice. These are just general observations. Okay, well, I think we've, we've actually run out of time, uh, unfortunately, because I wanted to pursue that a bit, but um, I'd like to thank both Brian London and Rich Chekin very, very much for their, um, well, their valuable insights. Uh, uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, thank the people that were listening. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask any of us, I know you can follow up with an email. Why don't we all just say, you know, how to get hold of us, I'll start. It's asset management at adrianday.com. Uh, for me, you can go to goldnewsletter.com or admin at jeffersoncompanies.com. Okay. And for me, you can email me directly, rchecken, C H E C K A N, at assetstrategies.com or info ASI at assetstrategies.com. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thanks, Thank Adrian. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian, and all. Thank you guys so much. And you, you beat me to it. I was just going to ask you how to share how, how everyone can get a hold of you. So that was perfect. <laughs>